All right, everyone, we're taking on the rest of the notes for chapter one here, picking things up with how formats are constructed. The different times of the broadcast day are called day parts. The research has shown that different populations or demographics listen to different day parts. They listen to radio at different times of the day. And when they listen at different times of the day, they do so for different reasons. So, for example, if you're listening to radio first thing in the morning, most of the time people are looking for a certain amount of information, maybe catching up on the overnight news. They're looking for what the weather's going to be like for today. Maybe they want to know what the traffic conditions are going to be like. Maybe some people that uh, especially have a hard time waking up in the morning need a little bit of uh, motivation and excitement. Uh, so a lot of uh, morning shows tend to have uh, certain types of uh, levity to them or just kind of that feel-good sort of atmosphere. During the workday, you want something that's going to help you stay motivated and positive. And on your ride home, perhaps you're getting ready to celebrate uh, the, the rest of the day or looking forward to the weekend and you get some music to uh, pump you up or encourage you or whatever the case may be. We listen at different times of the day for different reasons. Now, a very big industry that has grown up in recent years provides stations with what are kind of known as ready-to-use formats. These firms are known as syndicators, and they will provide satellite feeds, music tapes, program features ready for broadcast. Uh, this takes some pressure off of radio stations from having to come up with content 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to be able to use some of these other services that provides popular programming that may air across multiple cities across the state or across the country. Now, as we continue on looking at how formats are constructed, they enjoy a particular advantage in the media world because they reliably reach an identifiable audience. So, in other words, people that tune into a country station, they tend to be a certain type of person, and they tend to like that sort of music. So, they're going to be tuning into the country music station and not the opera station or the rap station or, or whatever else. The individual formats constructed for radio have that built-in appeal for certain types of audiences. And stations depend on a wide array of networks as different ancillary sources of programming, and they use them to supplement locally originated programming. So whenever you hear a national newscast or maybe a short feature, a business report or entertainment news or you know home improvement, self-care, whatever the case may be, those things help to supplement the overall programming besides just playing back-to-back -back music. Many radio networks have begun to offer blocks of radio programming to local stations as well. And we tend to think of the talk show uh, as one of those things that, um, you know, almost immediately comes to mind. But there's also various music shows like American Top 40 uh, or the Country Countdown and things like that. Holiday specials also fit into this category, all helping to supplement what a local radio station has to offer. Some other programming developments in radio, format syndication, network programming, and locally produced elements, they form the bulk of programming sources in modern radio. And we've been talking about that on certain levels. Short features, non-musical formats, they also thrive in what we hear on radio stations. So, uh, you know, we talked about business reports and, and different short features and things like that. Those things... You know, may not be the reason that people tune into a station, although if there's a feature that someone really likes and they know it's going to be on at a certain time of day, uh, they may make more uh, they may make more of an effort to tune in. Some of the non-musical things, whether it's uh, the the talk bits that an announcer does, or whether it's some sort of issue-driven programming, um, public affairs programming, or uh, special event programming, sporting events, concerts, things like that. Uh, those things help to attract audiences and stations as well. Let's talk about satellite radio now. Some of the advantages of satellite, 
When satellite radio emerged, it redefined radio by introducing new niche formats. Prior to that, you didn't hear a lot of uh, programming that was put together that only appealed to a small segment of the audience. But with satellite offering hundreds of channels, it was very easy to not just play popular music, but uh, you saw popular music by decade or you saw popular music that uh, was only by a certain segment of a format of certain artists, if you will, or uh, a particular subset of a genre of music. Satellite radio sounds better than terrestrial radio because the signals are digital. It's a much cleaner, crisper sound than what you can get over a regular antenna. They introduced modern production facilities. Uh, some of the studios that you see in radio stations uh, haven't changed in 40, 50 years. Um, and, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, but the facilities at Sirius XM, uh, they put a lot of investment in making those things state of the art. Receivers, they're capable of displaying the title of the song and the name of the artist. FM radio is doing that uh, in, in recent years, uh, but it was something that really caught on with the satellite service, uh, not just in terms of giving that information, but also uh, showing cover art and going into deeper detail about certain data about the, uh, the artist or the particular song or the album from where the song came from and all those sorts of things. So there were some pretty cool features. Uh, that satellite radio brought to the table. However, you do need to have that special receiver for the satellite service, and of course, you're paying for the service as well. And satellite radio is not local. Now, it says that it can't provide special weather or traffic info. Actually, at least for a while, I don't know if they still do or not, but uh, satellite radio experimented with providing uh, channels on its spectrum that were dedicated to weather and traffic in certain geographic markets. And uh, it was one of those things where, you know, it wasn't something that you would tune into for long periods of time. You would tune in long enough to get the weather and traffic information and then go on your way. But it was a thing. So... You know, on one hand, the programming at large is not local, but Satellite did try to provide local-ish services. As far as online radio, it continues to grow in popularity with various streaming platforms. 64% of U.S. adults stream audio from their smartphones on a weekly basis, and streaming audio accounts for 18% of adult audio listening time. Now, we're putting streaming separate from other things that you might hear online. YouTube audio and podcast, they come together to form about 15% of listening. So as a whole, new media really has captured the attention of people. Now, as far as advertising, 62% of adult U.S. listeners engage with ads on online audio services. And this is just below the engagement that we see on AM FM radio. So again, advertising, it's effective. It's reaching the audience. Now here's something you may have some experience with. Maybe you don't. HD radio. Now, one thing that we should note here is that HD in this case does not stand for high definition. It stands for hybrid digital. HD radio, hybrid digital radio. And what this is, it's a service that you pick up with an antenna. It gives the ability for terrestrial radio stations to send several digital signals over the air on one FM frequency. So what happens here is that, uh, for example, uh, Mix 101.5, uh, that is their main broadcast signal on 101.5 FM. You hear that particular variety hits format. Uh, but they have an HD2 that 
plays contemporary Christian music. They call it Cornerstone Radio. Uh, and many other stations in the Raleigh area and a limited number in the Greensboro and Fayetteville markets do similar sorts of things with their FM signals. And many of these radio stations also broadcast these signals online because HD radio has not really taken off uh, as some would have hoped that it has. You do find some HD radios in, in certain car models, uh, but they haven't been widely embraced in terms of people buying radios for home and things like that. Um, some other things, AM radio stations, some of them have also put their broadcast on an FM HD subchannel. Some FM stations lease their HD subchannels to other broadcasters. Uh, and if you want to see what sort of content is out there, if you've not checked it out, you can uh, go to the website that is in your notes, type in your zip code, and you can see what sort of things are available in uh, the area that you live in. Uh, depending on where you are, it will show you information for Raleigh or Greensboro or Fayetteville or for whatever uh, zip code that you type in. Non-commercial radio, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, basically, they gain their financial support strictly through the generosity of donors, both business donors and individual listener donors. Now, some of these outlets are affiliated with nonprofit organizations such as relig uh, religious organizations, community organizations, um, and many times the, your public radio stations will also be in this realm. But basically, as we talked about earlier, uh, they have somewhat of a different um, quote unquote business model. Again, these are supposed to be nonprofit entities, uh, but uh, they do need the financial support in order to keep their operations running. The economies of radio. Commercial stations make money by selling advertising time within the programming to reach specific listening audiences. That's how they stay afloat. When a corporation owns many radio stations, it can achieve economies of scale by consolidating functions such as management, technology, and programming. A great example of this would be iHeartRadio, which owns five radio stations in the Raleigh market, and it also owns radio stations in the Greensboro market. So all of those stations are housed together in one building, and they will share production resources. Sometimes they share talent across stations, uh, and sometimes they share talent among stations in different markets. Uh, so sometimes they share sales, sales staff between different markets. So it provides a certain amount of efficiency. It provides uh, some multitasking opportunities uh, on the part of the employees and a savings cost to the employer. Public radio is characterized by its participation in a funding structure that includes two major sources of revenue. We've talked about this already. Uh, there's private funds, uh, that would be your uh, listener donations and your business underwriters, but there may also, especially in the case of NPR stations, government funding. So you have your public stations like NPR and PRI. They provide programming that is not generally available through commercial outlets. And one of their main goals in public radio is to serve underserved audiences. So they try to reach those groups with content uh, that might not otherwise get it, at least from radio. Your nonprofit organizations like, like uh, colleges, churches, local community groups, they present an eclectic assortment of programming that doesn't really fit into specific format categories. A great example of this are the uh, the stations that uh, the college owns, WDCC in Sanford, WUAW in Lillington. Um, they play music from several different genres to try to appeal to the very tastes of students in the area. Um, the other thing that these nonprofit organizations do is they serve as important training grounds for people interested in radio as a career. It's a great place to learn. A major programming difference between non-commercial stations and mainstream radio, 
well, you could guess this, the absence of commercials. Again, on non-commercial radio, you could hear underwriting announcements. And many times there's a similarity in how they sound, but there's certain key elements about non-commercial announcements that air that make them distinct from traditional advertising. Um, and you'll hear about that in more detail in some of the other classes that we offer. Uh, again, there's all sorts of different opportunities available because of the different types of formats, the different types of programming content that non-commercial broadcasting offers. Um, I would encourage you, spend a weekend listening to a non-commercial radio station, especially uh, the NPR station out of Raleigh, uh, 91.5. Um, they air all sorts of stuff like talk shows, dramas, uh, comedy type things, musical performances. Uh, they run the gamut of the different types of content uh, that are available. Now, let's get to the meat of what this class is about, the role of the producer in modern radio. Production skills form the basis of producing a station's sound. And let's define what a producer is. A producer is anyone who manipulates sound to create an effect or deliver a message. Plain and simple. If you are causing something to go over the air in one way or another, you are a producer. Good production is an extension of the station's programming and a producer must tailor that production to reinforce the station's sound. It is the job of the producer to make sure that the station reaches its goals in how it presents itself over the air. Production people can play a major role in helping a station promote itself by creating imaginative uses of sound that create a clear identity for the station in listeners' minds. So the manipulation of that sound to create the sound, the format, the personality of the station, if you will, a good producer is going to be able to uh, create that experience for the listener. Now, from a mechanical standpoint, production is a method of combining various sources of sound into a product that accomplishes something specific. So the transition from one piece of music to another, uh, the way that stingers and transitions, the little bits of audio that you hear in between songs or uh, going from commercial back into music or finishing up a song, then you hear an announcer talk, all the ways that you could have the intermixing of different types of audio coming together. Uh, the manipulation of that is kind of the science of production, if you will. Real proficiency in radio requires professional commitment, experience, creativity, and a certain sense of adventure. So we're talking really here about the combination of science and art. There's the mechanical aspects of what a producer does to actually put the thing out there, but the stylistics and the feelings and and all of that which kind of connotates how a sound is produced and how that sound is received by the audience is very much an artistic sort of thing that is the result of the scientific efforts of pushing the right buttons and using volume in effective ways and how closely those things all fit together. So a truly effective production bears the identifying mark of its producer. It becomes rather unique. Again, that's why different stations that may have similar formats are going to have rather unique and different sounds to them. The skills involved are the tools. The way you use the tools makes the difference. So the tools, that's the mechanics of it, that's the science of it. How you use those tools is the artistry. And those things together make up the sound of a station. And that is all a result 
of what the producer is doing. So that's going to wrap it up for the notes. I would encourage you to look through the different blue sections that are in your textbook. We're going to talk about some of these things uh, when we get together for our class session. Uh, make sure you finish up the notes uh, and get those turned in. You also want to make sure you're taking a look at the study questions. Uh, there's a survey on Blackboard where you have the opportunity to uh, give your input. I take the things that you uh, put in the survey for me to be able to help guide our discussion when we get together. So please make sure that you do that. and. Uh, of course, make sure you're watching your email, watch Blackboard for any changes, updates, the things that we're doing. Uh, feel free to call me or email me if you have questions or concerns or issues. Uh, happy to help you out. Uh, otherwise, I'll look forward to receiving your work and I'll look forward to seeing you when we get together.